It is just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Dr. Richard A. Hewitt, DDS. He's the founder and CEO of Beachside Dental Consultants, ADA Second Vice President, FDA Board of Trustees. Uh, Rick Williford, MBA, CPA, CFP, love this guy. He said about you, Dr. Hewitt's enthusiasm for the profession, clinical expertise, and strategic planning perspective are a unique combination to guide any client to a more satisfying and productive practice. Richard does practice management consulting from a dentist perspective. If there's anybody that has lived management while practicing dentistry, it's Rick Hewitt. Starting in his hometown in Maine 32 years ago, Rick built a practice from scratch and averaged 50 new patients per month. After nine years, Rick sold his practice, moved to Vero Beach, Florida, and successfully bought and merged four existing practices into one. He produces in the top 20% nationwide on a 150-day work year. Dentist is hard work, so let Rick show you how to work smarter, not harder, while enjoying one of the most rewarding professions. Rick's prior experience in managing management consulting makes him an ideal boost to your practice health. His program to help your office can be customized to fit your needs and concentrates on financial benchmarks before, during, and after his initial work with your office. Dr. Hewitt has a very well diversified skill set in a variety of private, public, and nonprofit work settings. Always look for new fields to explore in healthcare, information technology, um, at, for his healthcare consulting. And you moved from Maine um, to Florida, so did you just get burned out on lobster? You're just like, I can't eat one more lobster, or was it the weather? Uh, you know, it's funny because we were just talking before the show that I, I was in uh, your neck of the woods for two years in Arizona in 83 and eight through 85. And I got used to those long summers that you had in Arizona, but I missed I miss the four seasons, as I thought. And then I went back and... Were, were you at Williams Air Force Base or Luke? I was at Williams on the southeast Will. Phoenix side. And Which I was is- back and how would you, some of your readers, uh, some of your viewers would know this, but they had just extended the Superstition Highway out to Williams Field Road when I was there. So that just shows you Chandler, where the base is located, was 17,000. What's the population now? 270,000. So. Demographics matter. It certainly does. Yeah. So left, I left an area that was booming, and I went back to my hometown, and Maine's economy was booming in the, in the mid-'80s, but it slowed down, and uh, the weather got to me, and my wife and I decided to go down I-95, 1,500 miles away and live in Florida. Was it more you or your wife? I think weather-wise, it was my wife, because she was in turtlenecks 11 and a half months of the year. Yeah. So, I said, you know, we can always, I said, I can spend continuing education money and go to every Southern course there is for the next 20, 25 years, or we can just make the move now. So uh, we voted on it and uh, the move is there. Yeah. And what's weird is now you're in Florida, um, Maine in the far Northwest of the United States is actually just 5,300 kilometers from Africa, um, Morocco, whereas Florida's easternmost point, Singer Island, is 6,500 kilometers from Africa. It's hard to imagine on a three-dimensional globe that Maine is closer to Africa than Florida, but it is. And the thing that blew my mind, I remember the first time I lectured in Brazil at the Aesthetica 2000 conference with 4,000 people in attendance, that South America is not south of North America. You, If I go straight down Phoenix, I go straight down south, it's ocean all the way to the, the south to Antarctica. And that South America is way out there east of uh, America in the ocean. Uh, so um, so now you're further away from Africa. Um, and you were, you're the, um, are you the trustee now? Or you were the, um, are, are you the, currently the uh, FDA Board of Trustees? So I, I got off the FDA Board of Trustees right as I became Vice President of the ADA, but that term finished out last year. So those are two past officer positions that I have. And you and I are both friends with the um, the newly elected president-elect, um, Caesar Sabatez, who was my classmate at UMKC, and he's friends with you down in Florida. How is that um, being a vice president? How cool is it that you know uh, the president-elect Caesar? Well, sir, I was on the board of the ADA with Caesar for two years, 
And I had the pleasure of working with him at the FDA level also. But it is amazing how many UMKC grads practice in Florida. There's quite a big alumni down in this area. So, we were, you know, there was you know, one of your classmates. I actually bought his practice uh, in Vero Beach many years ago. So there's a... You Are you talking about Joe DiCiano? That's correct. Oh, my God. I love Joe DiCiano. Oh, my gosh. And that was a neat story. He was a, um, a, the family had an Italian restaurant. He worked at the restaurant for years, and he always thought if he had to do it all over again, he would have gone to dental school. Then he realized, I think when he was a freshman in my class, I think he was already like 40 or something. And um, he saved up his money, and everybody in the class just thought it was so cool that this guy had a restaurant for 20 years who always dreamed about being a dentist and and did it. I mean, uh, my gosh. Well, what, what's he doing now? Well, he, when I bought his practice, he was moving to the West Coast and I lost track of him, but he needed to sell his practice in Vero. And that's part of the uh, part of the things that I like to do is to emphasize, you know, when I do consulting is, is that every dentist has great patients. And some dentists, you know, we're, the, the dental field now is more mobile. Somebody might, you know, the traditional model that you know of, is somebody plunks down and stays in that same city for 20, 30 years or even more than that. But, you know, with the, with the demographics we have of more women in the dental profession, you're not going to see that as much in the next 20 years. So people, people will have, you know, practices will come up for sale. And uh, they're great opportunities. I, uh, bought, I bought two of them in Maine, a, a lot, even after I started from scratch. I bought two practices in Maine and then sold that when I left. And then when I came down to Vero, I actually bought one that was existing and bought three more before I stopped practicing as an owner in 2008. But I can tell you, every dentist has great patients. And uh, if, you, if you can work it out and you can, if you have the, the selling dentist work back for you, it's even a, a win-win situation. It's goodwill, you know, and, and everybody has, everybody likes to hand off their patients to somebody when they leave that they, they can trust. And your patients appreciate that. Well, I want to, um, since, um, well, first of all, Joe DiCiano, if you're out there listening, my gosh, give, uh, uh, send me an email, uh, Howard at dentaltown.com. Um, but um, since you were just finished your um, vice president of the ADA, since you're a trustee, since you know a Caesar, I want to um, uh, derail this interview and go right to, um, one of the biggest threads on Dentaltown is cancel your ADA membership. The guy starts off, uh, dental offices should have never been closed down, and I totally blame the ADA. They majorly dropped the ball. I'll never be a member again. And he posted that in um, 6-8, so uh, what is that, uh, June 8th, uh, June, so July, August, September, October, November. So in the following five months, it's just exploded. It's one of the biggest threads on dentistry. Um, my position, I've always been a member of the ADA, and the reason I've been a member of the ADA is because the United States has one million attorneys, and they're always trying to negotiate for whoever they're representing. And they're representing big insurance companies, all, all these different sets, and someone has to be sitting at that table playing poker uh, for me, and and that's why I remember. They're, I always seem as they're like my parents. Uh, my parents aren't perfect, uh, but they're my parents. My mom is. Uh, I she's already emailed me and called me three times a day. Um, you know they can be um, good, bad, crazy, whatever. Um, but they're still your only parents. And um, gosh, what do you say to these dentists who say that um, they're not going to be a member? And they would rather just practice alone in their dental office and have nobody sitting, especially at the state level. Like, it's not just the American Dental Association. Like, you're from the Florida Dental Association. What percent of the average working dentists know the issues going on in the Florida legislator that could affect their dental office, and they need someone like you and Caesar arguing for your point of view? What, what would you say to those people? Well, you're spot on, number one. But I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you that I used to watch your podcast, and I think you compared the American Dental Association years ago in the best light that I ever said. You compared it to going to church, and I thought that is great. That is a perfect analogy. If you've ever been to church, it's like it's you know deep down inside you should do that, and it betters you. But you know you sort of kind of say, well, I'm not sure if I really want to do that. I'm a general dentist. 
And I'm a member of the Academy of General Dentistry and a member of the American Dental Association. Not because I do, you know, I, because I'm involved with those organizations. I look at it as an insurance policy for the crazy things that happen. And believe you hit it right on the nail when you, you, you hit it right on the nail when you're talking about state legislatures. They can get a little crazy. And they, they, that is the tripartite of the ADA is we're unique in that. If you belong to, if you're an attorney, you don't have to belong to the National Bar Association, the State Bar Association, but in the ADA, and it's been held up in court, you have to belong to all three. And it really, what it is, is it's just malpractice prevention from legislators. That's what it is. And both, both I think, personally, as a general dentist, I feel I should belong to the, those two organizations. If I were an endodontist, I would belong to the ADA and the American Association of Endodontics. And I think because, you know, the ADA, even though it's 80% general dentists, that there are some things that are unique to specialty groups. And you have to look at general dentists as a specialty group. And you should belong to both of those organizations. Now, I, you know, we don't have time in this podcast to prove it, but you can save your dues just by some of the programs that are offered. And I know you can get other, I know you can get deals and I know you have them through your, your uh, dental town uh, thing, but I'm talking about things like life insurance, disability, products that you probably don't offer through your membership that, that you know, is unbelievable. They have, uh, they have the best rates by far. Yeah. Um, but what, what would you, um, what do you, what what about the issue though? Where um, closing down? Where he was saying, you know, the the issue for him was dental offices should have never been closed down, and I totally blame the ADA. Um, they, you know, you can say that, but I know these dentists weren't sitting around the table with all the stakeholders. I know for a fact. I I interviewed um, Chad, the the existing president of the ADA, and I mean they, they were they were getting calls from all kinds of big major institutions within the United States and from around the world. So um, what would you say to this dentist sitting here doing a root canal thinking, well, if it was me, I mean, he wasn't talking to all these other uh, agencies. So I would tell this dentist, so in your hometown, wherever you practice, your intern has closed his office or her office. The surgery center closed their office. Do you honestly believe that we would get any credibility as a health profession? If the dentists were still open, I, it, it doesn't make any sense. And I, I, Chad and I talked before his decision. Chad is a, obviously a, a real close friend and was a great president. And he had to make a tough decision. And he called a lot of his you know, close friends and said, what do you think of my decision? And I said, Chad, you had to do it. And you're going to either get vilified for it or you're going to get praised. And in hindsight, when you think about it, the original uh, closing issue was for only, I think, three or four weeks. Now, the state legislatures in Florida popped early and allowed dental practices to return, but everybody knows that it was a state-by-state -state issue. Like, I don't know when Arizona dentists were allowed to come back, but I do know that the Arizona Dental Association was right there for them lobbying as far as the safety about coming back. So just as fast as we had to close them and sort of kind of go along with the Band-Aid, we were right there to uh, ensure that we could practice in a safe manner, which we're doing now. You've seen the stats. Less than 1% of dentists have uh, are There's a less than 1% infection rate of dentists and their staffs. So it's obvious that we, could, we handle this. And I think we handle it in a, in a great manner. The other thing that we found out all along the way while we were closed is, hey, guess what? Dentistry is an essential service. You need that. You know, people sit there and grind their teeth worrying about COVID all day long. Guess what? They bust cusps. They break teeth. And something that they've been putting off for years is now coming up to the forefront. Well put. And and you're, um, my gosh, you're uh, consulting. Um you know, we were closed down for two months and, um, 
I was closed down um, um, St. Patrick's Day to Cinco de Mayo. So the Irish shut me down. And the Mexicans opened me back up. Uh, that's what I think when I'm ordering a drink. I'm, I've switched to all margaritas and uh, given up on the Jameson because they closed me down. But you're, you're a dental practice management consultant. And we're hearing, um, you know, the ADA um, first uh, Vucicek was saying uh, a couple months ago that uh, the industry was down uh, about 30% to about 70%. His latest numbers are showing that the the entire profession of dentistry is down about 38%. So that's almost 40. And projecting next year, 2021, that it'll be down 20%. You're in Florida. Um, what's it look like on the ground to you? And um, what, what would you say to these dentists when they're looking at their operating in a macroeconomic environment that's down 38%? I mean, it's a lot nicer to go into a business where you have a, a tailwind behind you, like, you know, like, like you're talking about Chandler, Arizona. When you open up in Chandler, there's 17,000, and now there's 277,000. If you couldn't have found a new patient out of that, uh, you're, you know, something's wrong. But imagine if you were in a town with 277,000 dentists, and 20 years later, it's down to 17,000. I, I would be telling you that you're in the wrong place to move. So what, what, what do you tell, what, first of all, what do you see on the ground in Florida as far as busyness levels? Well, from what, I'm, from what my colleagues are telling me, and I don't do just Florida practices, but my colleagues, you know, they, got, they, they were as busy as they were going nuts when they first opened back. But keep in mind that everything was shut down around the March, mid-March timeframe. So if you, extra, if you extrapolate out for six months, now there's your hygiene now. It's kind of like when we have hurricanes in Florida, our hygiene schedule gets kind of messed up because people have other expenses. They lost their roof. Well, guess what? They're going to replace their roof before they come and see you. And in this particular, in this particular pandemic, you have the added part about the medical portion of it and people were a little afraid to come back just to get their teeth cleaned. So I'm sitting around, you know, in, in my community over here, and I'm playing tennis with a couple of friends of mine, and they're, they're saying, well, Rick, is it safe to go back to get my teeth cleaned? And I go, yeah, it's safe. Yeah, I, I, you know, I know the dentist you go back, you're going back to, and it'll be fine. But there was that hesitant, hesitant part of, of patients. Now, the emergency part took care of itself. So a lot of dentists were very busy originally just doing emergency care and fixing things. But then now projected out, I think you're going to see, I, I've seen Marco's numbers and I agree with him in, in perception, but I also think that it comes from, I also think that it, it, it's dependent on a state by state basis. There are, let's face it. I mean, I mean, I know you know this from your, your client base and, and, you know, your dental town folks. There are some states that are doing better than others. And one, of, one of the things that's pretty well uh, documented right now is, is the states that opened up earlier are doing much better. Kind of like the state's, you know, economies. I mean, Disney is open in Florida, but it's not open in California. That's going to affect, that's going to affect the economy in Anaheim a heck of a lot more than it's going to affect the economy in Orlando. I think you can understand that. So, um, Florida is, um, I mean, that's a, um, that's just a big state. I mean, uh, um, Florida has 21 million people. The, uh, Texas has 28 and the, the largest is California at 39 million, which actually doesn't sound like a lot. And I lectured in New Delhi and that city has a population of 39 million. The city of Delhi has more people than California, um, Texas. So they're 39, Texas, 28, Florida is 21 million. New York's only 19 million. Um, that's just a huge, huge state. And it, it's, it's kind of interesting because, um, Florida is the only state where the, more south you go, uh, the more north it is. Because uh, you go south, everyone's from like where you are up in Maine, and then you go north, it's really the south. It's like Georgia. Um, so, do you have? You're in Vero Beach, and um, is that? Sorry to say this, but when you live in Arizona, I, I think that it's probably like a bunch of people over sixty-five. Is that an old folks community? Um, is that an old folks town, or is it a different mix of dentistry than say just a regular? you know, uh, Kansas City, Missouri, you know, just the, the, full, the full spectrum? So the demographics in Florida have changed completely, and so has Vero, where I live. 
So the, the fastest growing demographic in Florida right now is the younger, you know, age uh, one to 18, because a lot of families have settled here. We've got a tremendous amount of immigration from South America, you know, in the South Florida area. But I'm kind of like about, I'm directly across from Tampa. So I'm mid-state, if you want to call it that. And we get, uh, we get a high amount of retired people from Connecticut, New York, New Jersey, just flying out of those, those states because of uh, the tax situation and because of COVID and the New England states also. But interestingly enough, we're, getting, we're picking up a lot of people from Illinois and we're picking up a lot, a lot of people from California. Not as much as Arizona does, but you've been in Arizona long enough to see these waves of Californians that move from California to Arizona, especially when the, uh, the, uh, the tax situation gets crazy in California. And we've, we've, we're getting over a thousand new people a day in Florida. And, and it's, it is amazing, the influx. And there, uh, you may have heard of this community in just north of Orlando called the Villages. And it's, it's amazing. I mean, it's a huge retirement area and it's growing in leaps and bounds. Yeah. Um, uh, top 10 states growing numeric growth. We said California was uh, number one population, 39 million. Uh, but they um, they don't even make the top 10 for growth. Um, they're, they're losing population. Um, my practice since 1987, 10% of all the new patients came from California. Um, and the people in California don't get it. Like San Diego used to be the, the international tuna fish capitaling capital of the world. They caught all the tuna. They processed it. They canned it. They shipped it around. And then the environmentalists came in and said, oh, it's not, you know, it's not good. And they regulated it and taxed it and killed it. But here's, here's where I draw the line. Did people in California stop eating tuna fish? Oh, hell no. And now that it's done on all these other poor countries, do you think they do it environmentally better or environmentally worse? And that's what America does. They, they, they regulate you to death until the business dies, but they don't change your behavior. It's like all these people that um, um, want me to drive an electric car, and then they go out and buy an F-350, you know, uh, for $100,000. But I, wanna, I don't want to get into politics, sex, religion, or violence, but young dentists have asked me this, and I, I'm going to ask you because um, you're, you should know. Um, you're out there on some type of, it's not like an island, but it's Vera Beach, but I mean, it's, what do, you, what do you even call that? It's a barrier, the barrier island side. So you have the uh, intercoastal, which runs all the way from Key West. That runs right up through the Chesapeake area in Maryland and goes right straight up, up the mid-Atlantic states. So essentially, you know, you think of North Carolina has the barrier side and, you know, those are the more famous one. But we have a, basically we're on the, uh, there's Vero Beach and Vero Beach has a land side and a barrier island side. I happen to be in a various side, but since I do consulting and work from home, uh, you know, I don't really need geographically, although my office, when I had an office, was literally five miles down A1A from, from where I live. So I had a nice little commute in the morning and it was really relaxing and uh, sold my practice and uh, did great. However, I still have active licenses in four states and I do per diem work if the need uh, is is there. I have a lot of brokers as as friends who say, hey, Rick, I could use you to work uh, for this, you know, dentist that's thinking of selling and just had a, you know, an injury or something like that. And I can do that kind of work. And a lot of times when I'm doing that, I can actually write an operating plan for them. In the Air Force, I used to do operations inspections. Basically, I would go into a base, look at how they could improve their productivity. And this came in really handy after 9-11, um, you know, we lost 15% of our dental corps. They, they, the officers were relocated to war fighting. And uh, so the, the dentists in the Air Force had to work a little harder. But more importantly, they had to work smarter and be more productive. And uh, we inspected bases. We digitized them. We got them new facilities. And uh, they're, guess what? Their production increased by 40%. That's well, not a coup. Well, here's here's the politically incorrect question they're asking uh, me, and that is, um, 
I know uh, after this last election, let me just say one thing that um, America is completely divided. There's two, you know, the, there, there's two um, different views of moving forward, and it, it's neck and wire. So if your team won or lost, um, you're still right here. There's eight billion people stuck on Earth. You're not getting off, um, and um, you know you got to figure out how to work together. But another really politically sensitive thing to talk about is global warming. And a lot of the young dentists are saying, well, you know, where Rick is, um, is isn't that going to be underwater? And they see news reports like your Florida coastal home could lose 15% of its value by 2030 due to sea rise. And it could lose up to 35% of its value up to new report. If you were a young kid and you just graduated from Nova, I'm serious, you're, they're 25 years old. And let's say you were selling your practice and everything was right about it and they really wanted to buy there. But then they're thinking... Damn, is this is this going to be underwater? I mean, what what would you tell a young kid? Because they're going to practice from twenty five to sixty five. I mean, they're going to be there for forty years. I mean, I've already been in my office for thirty two years. Um, so, what would you what would you say to a, a young twenty five year old that was going to buy your practice as you were uh, rowing out to the ocean? <laughs> um, so, my office was about five hundred yards from the ocean. Uh, and in 1989, I can tell you the building's in the same place and the water's at the same level it was in 1989 as it is now. So anybody that thinks that the water is going to suddenly rise by two feet because some glacier is melting in the Arctic Ocean is, uh, you know, it kind of gets spread out on the way down here. Uh, I, climate change is, uh, there's a difference. I don't believe in global warming. I believe in climate change. But I can tell you that there have been no more hurricanes in Florida since we got here than uh, what we went through this year. Now, there were a lot of storms this year, but very few of them made landfall as hurricanes. So I don't, I don't want to get into politics of this, too, because I think, first of all, it's what I would consider way above our pay grades when it comes to actual statistics. But I really wouldn't worry about setting up a dental practice uh, because of climate change in the state of Florida. Now, down south in Miami, there are areas of the city that they've had to do mitigation as far as the water levels. But that's true just about everywhere you know, on the coast. Uh, you know, you can go up to North Carolina and you can see that. You could go to uh, the West Coast and see that. Uh, so I don't think I would concern myself about where practicing. Uh, there are a couple of practices on the barrier side. And to tell you the truth, most, most of the dentists in, uh, in Vero Beach practice on the other side, the land side, if you want to call it so. But nobody's, nobody's office is under four feet of water because if the insurance companies knew that there was a high likelihood of that, they would have already reflected that. Enough. I know. That's what I've been saying the whole time. It's like, I don't, you know, I, I don't want to get in the politics of it, but you know, when, when Bill Maher always says, you know, 98% of all climate change. So yeah, that's called groupthink, Bill. Did you just learn about groupthink? I mean, you couldn't get a job at the wall street journal. If you believed in communist Marxism, they kind of only hire people that kind of believe in Milton Friedman. So that's what you see in everything. You see this groupthink thing. Um, but, Wall Street, my God, those people only see dollars and cents. And if they really, really thought this was an issue, do you think they'd be loaning 30-year mortgages to a uh, dental office and houses on the beach? Well, oh, yeah, he's got the Wall Street Journal right there. He, okay, so I would tell, your, I would tell your, your fans out there, these are, the two mag, these are the two papers you have to read. What do you do online or not? Whatever, whatever your purview is, I'm sitting here in Florida and it gets thrown in my driveway every morning. But I'm going to tell you this, okay? USA Today, very liberal, very left-leaning, written for an eighth grade education. It's got a lot of nice graphs though. But that's what your patients, you know, you can put that one in your reception area. The Wall Street Journal is written for about a senior year in high school reading level. And it's more conservative. And you, some of the articles you mentioned are there. But this is how you educate yourself. This is what they taught you in the military is you do opposition research, right? You read about one point of view and then you read about another point of view. You don't take everything for granted. And if you can do that, you will have a successful business one way or another. Now, 
a lot of the education, a lot of the media has shifted for our young dentists to their phones. So you can do the same thing, right? You and I know you could, I bet you, you could call out 10 names of, of online news sources now that are new and coming up and they're probably most of the younger people are probably looking at stuff like that now. But it's always good to have a, you know, more than one point of view because groupthink, like you said, is dangerous. Like the herd. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and I love um, calling out um, opposition research. Um, some dentists actually get mad at me because I'm um, interviewing DSO captains. And they'll send me emails like, they're the enemy. What are you, what are you interviewing them for? And it's like, what? The, the, you, you're running one office. This guy's running 500. You can't learn something from this guy. And you would have called it opposition research. And I've stole every, I like Dentaltown Online CE. That wasn't my idea. I live in Phoenix. And every time I was driving to the airport, I saw University of Phoenix Online. And it had to go from not one building, but two buildings. It took nine buildings before my thick skull said, Oh, I wonder if I should put an online CE course on Dentaltown, you know? And and now we've had a million views, but none of these are my ideas. Um, I, I just I just make an art of stealing the best ideas that we've learned through history. And that's what I love about dental consultants like you is that, um, you know, this guy is sitting here practicing in his office and he can't even figure out his own office. And then you've seen a gazillion offices for many, many, uh, many, many years. So, um, so basically, um, surviving this uh, uh, pandemic and uh, being a dental consultant, um, what are the dentists doing that you're working with? Um, what are they doing more of if they're having better numbers? And what are the dentists that are still, you know, down 38% plus? What, what, sh- what should they be doing or at least thinking about? So do the opposition research for the people that are doing better. So intuitively, if you have all this PPE that you have to put on, right? Wouldn't it make sense that you need to do more procedures per patient? Because that way you don't have to change this stuff every every time. Would it make sense to maybe like allocate your hygiene department to make sure that one dentist checks, you know, uh, patients and maybe a de- uh, uh, one dentist that's working on an implant case or a surgical case shouldn't come out of scrubs. It makes sense. It's not only is it less costly. So what you have to do is, I think what we have to do in, in, in dentistry right now is there are some offices, and I know you've seen plenty of them, that still do this like, you know, wham, bam, you know, a couple of fillings in this and that's it. I think you have to do some comprehensive treatment planning and it doesn't have to be full mouth cases, but if, if you're going to do restorative cases, the days of doing like one or two restorations per sitting are gone. If, you, if, if, if this stuff is costing you $20 to $30 every time you've gone up, now we're not going to be in COVID forever, but I think, I think now's the time to change. And the dentists that I know that are doing really well, the ones that are talking to me and saying, you know, I, I know I always should have done this. COVID forced me to do this, but I see less patients and do more of them at one sitting. And by doing that, of course, that's going to take a lot. As you know, that's going to take a lot of hands-on verbal skills from front staff, you know, from front desk staff saying, oh, Mrs. Jones, by the way, this, this appointment, this isn't like your $200 appointment like you're used to. This is going to be a $2,000 appointment because we're going to do this, 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 and this. Because Dr. Jones figures out that you probably don't want anybody else. You want to get this done in one city. And we have the, you know, of course, with payment plans and, and, you know, tools such as care credit and other types of third party payment plans. There's really no reason in this, in this universe that you're not doing that. It is amazing how many dentists still do the crowd of the month for. I mean, you know, I think you know about that and, and, uh, then the other thing is, is from a procedural point of view, why is it that one dentist can do a crown prep in five minutes and another dentist takes an hour? Because they have done studies and showed that the dentist, after somebody looked at him, a third party looked at him and really couldn't tell the difference on the preps, which ones were done in five minutes and which ones were done in an hour. So wouldn't it make sense to get a CE course 
on how to effectively do a crown prep in five minutes or so. I'm sure that, I mean, you've been in a chair practically as long as I have. We're, we're the same age group. And, uh, you know, you certainly have increased the speed of your crown preps over the years, but you may have taken a course on how to do that also or figured it out on your own. And in dentistry, it's a dead giveaway because every general dentist will tell you, well, you know, that guy is doing a crown prep half hour. He's cutting corners and, you know, Burger King has a uh, you know, square or uh, Wendy's has square patties because they don't cut any corners and I'm not cutting any corners. I'm going to, I'm going to spend an hour and a half to do this. And I'm like, dude, how long does it take you to do a molar root canal? He says, I don't know, an hour and a half. Okay, end it on an hour. How long would it take you to pull these four wisdom teeth? An hour. Okay, an oral surgeon, 15 minutes. Every, spe- oh my God, have you ever seen a pediatric dentist? What I would rather, where if I had to do that case, first of all, I would just tear up my license and run to another country. Uh, but the speed they do it, and this, I got a friend who's a pediatric dentist, and her thumb is the bite block. She doesn't even care. You can chow down on that thumb, and she's going to knock out that chrome silk crown while she's confusing you about Elmo or something. And um, there's so we already know in dentistry, the specialists are much faster. So you saying that going slow is because you're conscientious and you're doing it better and someone else is doing it faster, better, easier, cheaper, smaller is, um, is not a good person. There's just no evidence for that. And it was Regina Hertzlinger. Uh, I got an MBA master's in business administration. She has a doctor's in business administration from none other than Harvard, which was the first university in the United States. So first mover advantage will always have the biggest brand name. That's why Coca-Cola is still better than Pepsi because it started a decade earlier. But um, Regina Hertzlinger called it the focus factory. And she said, if you um, study, if a surgeon only removes appendix, that's all he does, he will have significantly higher success rate than some general internist who does five or six different surgeries and all of them take twice as long. She says, you want to go to someone who only does one thing and they'll do it faster, better, easier, cheaper, everything. So, um, I, couldn't, I couldn't agree with you more. There are orthopedic surgeons in Florida, you know, in Vero Beach that do left knees on a certain day. So if you don't think that has something to do with efficiency, and I, I can tell you right now, getting back to your molar root canal story, if you're taking an hour and a half for a molar root canal, you have two options. Number one, you need to refer out. Or number two, you need to get somebody into your office that does them in a faster, faster than that. There's just, it's just not a really, you know, it, it, it's a pride thing. You know, some people think that you have to do everything in general dentistry to succeed. I think you and I have reached our comfort zones. And we know what we we refer to, you know, I in the military, I used to do a lot of wisdom teeth. But my rule was under local anesthetic, if I can't just do the set of wisdom teeth at an hour, I need to refer this to one of the oral surgeons or somebody that could do it under IV that wants to take a little bit longer. It made no sense for me. It made no sense for the patient. You know, you, you have to think about patient comfort in this also. Also, when you do root canals, if you're not sealing that thing, before you leave, if you're not either doing the core and the crown on the same appointment, you're doing that patient a a tremendous injustice because everybody knows, every study I've seen lately says, if you don't have a good seal on a root canal, you're you're destining that tooth to to something that it shouldn't be. Um, You, um, your website, it's called mil- www.militarydentist.com. In fact, even your email is Dr. Hewitt at, well, I'm sorry. Is that rude to give out your email address? Um, no, go right ahead. Yeah, if you, if you have a question, just, I mean, go to his website. It's military dentist, uh, dentist, not with an S, just dentist, military dentist, one guy. And his email is Dr. Hoyt. It's pronounced Hewitt, but it's spelled H-U-O-T at militarydentist.com. Um, to, you know, Lots of people have been in the military before, but they don't they don't name their website military dentist. Um, I, I would think that for you to name your um website and your practice uh militarydentist.com that you have very positive thoughts about your experience in the military. Um you went in um and, and there's a lot of kids listening to you right now that are in dental school that might be thinking about joining uh the military. You were in the Air Force. Talk talk about your journey. How did a kid eating lobster in Maine end up in the Air Force and out here at uh, Williams Air Force Base? Okay, 
So the one, and I'm happy to talk about that, and I, I really enjoy it. And I'm glad. Thanks for asking. The, the militarydentist.com was only for my consultant company. I, my my the name of my practice was Beachside Dental, which is no longer. So that, but I did have that that website also, but that was purchased with the practice when I sold it. So the military dentist is basically for my speaking and consulting. And I grabbed it because nobody had it. And I said, well, geez, I'm going to do it. And one of the things about the military is, so I'm sitting in, uh, I'm sitting December of 1981 in at Northwestern. The economy is like in, in shattered, it's in tatters. Uh, Ronald Reagan just got in and they just jacked up the interest rates about 18 and a half percent on the prime rate. Now, you and I can remember those days. Your father was in business in those days. And I mean, that, that's loan shark rates, you know, when you think about it. And uh, I looked around and said, you know, I don't think I'm ready to get right out of dental school into private practice. I had an idea that I wanted to go back to Maine. My uncle was a dentist in my hometown, but he wasn't ready to retire. And he certainly didn't have enough extra patience for me. So I was looking at a scratch practice start in 1982 when I graduated with the interest rate somewhere around 16. And I said, you know something? I think the Air Force is looking real good right now. And it was the best decision I ever made in my life. Uh, you know, I went to a small base. It's not a small base anymore. Osan Air Base in Korea. There were six general dentists. We were of varying ages. And we did all the work that was there. Anything else we had to refer. If we had to refer something, it had to go to the Army base at, in Seoul, which was an hour away by bus. So we got to be really good at doing general dentistry and everything else that goes along with it. Uh, and then after serving for a year in Korea, since it was a remote location, I wasn't married at the time. Uh, I was you know, considered a remote assignment. You got to pick where you wanted to. And I looked around the, the, uh, the country and said, you know, I've never lived in the Southwest. It's a great opportunity for two years to live. Let's see what Phoenix has got to offer. And uh, I think I'll live in this town called Mesa. And it's not too far from the base. So that's where I put my roots down for two years. Wow. Um, so, you know, when you um, started your lecturing and consulting business and everything, um, I uh, think of you, it seemed like you were talking a lot about um, asset fraud protection, internet, social security, media security, retirement portfolio analysis, financial reporting, quick and home budget review, accounts receivable review, collection service, accounts payable review, QuickBooks setup, um, estate review, asset and insurance protection, merger acquisition strategy, human resource review, performance and salary review processes, strategic planning, office core values, productivity analysis, procedure and coding analysis, insurance contract analysis, internal and external marketing analysis, social media, life coaching, health and fitness analysis, um, equipment purchase uh, analysis supply. Has your consulting, um, how much of that is still what you talk about versus pre-pandemically versus post-pandemic? How much have you had to shift on your um, post-pandemic? I think mostly now uh, people are asking a lot of retirement questions. I think this for the older dentists, this has really changed their outlook on do I really want to still continue on? But I like the merger and acquisitions part. I really still like that. I still think that there's tremendous opportunities for young dentists who probably have A, a better facility, and B, more modern equipment to absorb a, an older practice and bring that uh, practitioner in, you know, and, and let them practice with them. And it would be a uh, a symbiotic relationship. The other thing I did in, in my spare time was uh, I went through the College of Financial Planning in Denver, and I went through the whole CFP program. Now, I actually didn't sit for the, uh, the, the test that gives me those letters after, but I, took, I passed all six sections. So it made me just enough, just dangerous enough to state on my website that I work with any financial professionals, because I think it's important for young dentists to get a hold of a good accountant, a good financial planner. And like, like you found out over the years, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing better than starting early on a 401k and just letting uh, compound interest do the rest. 
And that's one of the reasons that I, you know, I, one of the philosophies I have is the dental career is it's a marathon. It's not, a, it's not a race. It's not a sprint. So you got to pace yourself. But the easiest way to do it is to make sure that you put away the maximum amount every year in a retirement plan. And you shouldn't even look at the stock market right now. As a young dentist, you should be putting the maximum account as the maximum amount you can and whether it's a 401k, whether it's a Roth or both, you should be putting all that away as best as you can. You should be paying yourself first in your retirement accounts before you even bring a, a dime home. Well, you know, um, Wall Street, it's just, it's built on m and activity. And these dental offices, I mean, uh, these, these DSOs, I mean, uh, I mean, gosh, they're looking at, should I start a de novo office where here's a, a group practice that has eight locations? I mean, that's all they do is MA. Um, every I noticed way back in my career, it's like every once in a while I'd run into some dentist doing like three to four million a year, taking out a million. And I'm like, what the hell? How did you do that? And he says, well, I, you know, I set up in this small town and there were five dentists. And each time the oldest guy put his office up for sale, I didn't want to sell to some young kid like you with a bunch of energy it's like i'll buy out the old man and i'll move it into mine and he says those old men never they always think they have enough money to retire and an hour after they retire they want a new truck the wife wants a new you know the the grandkids and he goes so then they end up staying on an extra day or two for years after they thought they were going to retire and and they just built i mean they literally own the town why do you think m a activity uh, rules Wall Street and dentistry doesn't even look at it. And you did it when you moved to, from Maine to Florida. Uh, you emanated four offices and rolled them into one. And um, and how does that MA activity look today post pandemic? Because when you look at Dental Town, it's had free classified ads forever. It's the hottest. It's one of the hottest sections on the site. There's always been about one thousand dental offices for sale and four thousand jobs available. Now there's 2,000 dental offices for sale and only 1,000 jobs available. That's why I tell people that a socialist means that you own your means of production. And if there was an economic downturn and you're an employee who's just a wage slave, a time wage slave, you'll be fired. But the guy who owns his own dental office can uh, adjust and raise prices if there's inflation. But what, how, how is the M&A activity change post pandemic and why do you think it's so overlooked in dentistry except for the major dso's because because i think the dso's get it and they have the venture capital to do it and i'd like to think this is when you when you come up with a selling price and i'm not going to tell you how to do that there's a variety of ways you can get appraisals all that stuff can get done but when you come to a final agreement I guarantee you that you can probably pay the nut, that monthly payment, just on the hygiene of that acquired dental, dental office. And if you're doing that, the rest is just gravy. And if, if you have an, an older dentist that says, hey, Rick, I want to just work two days a week. I don't want to work this four-day-a-week stuff. Guess who gets to do the other two days of work? I mean, there's just absolutely no reason why, if I were a young dentist that's 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 really I would be scouring that dental town uh, classifieds right now and looking at every one of them that's in the area. Now some dentists are not going to really some dentists might not want to advertise that because they don't want to let the competition know that they're uh, you know considering selling. But I would challenge that young dentist. You take the five oldest dentists in your town. You invite them out to dinner one night. You pay for it and you say, hey, listen. The reason I'm asking you right now at dinner is I'm going to be totally honest with you. If any of you have any chance, any idea of probably slowing down, I'd like to have the opportunity to practice with you and just let it go at that. And you might even see something that comes out of that because that's what I did. I took, there was a, the, the, uh, this dentist that was, uh, he was a Northwestern grad from 1951 that was practicing in Vero. He was just going to shut his practice down. He had some amazing patients. And I, and I took him out to lunch three or four times. And the last time I took him out, he told me, he goes, Rick, you don't have to sell. You don't have to sell me yourself anymore. I've decided that I'm going to come. I'm going to come in with you because I think my patients will be best off with you. Now, what were his options at the time? He could have sold to a DSO that probably didn't, that may or may not have had, you know, it wasn't as popular back then. But I can tell you that 
putting it out and you know on the market and stuff, you probably didn't really have the patience for that. So you might you might do these deals, and what do you get in these? What do you get in these M and A's, right, Howard? You get equipment, you get employees. There's a tremendous amount. You get a steady patient. If you're going to spend sixty five dollars, you know, per patient marketing. Wouldn't you rather spend the money on an established patient versus one that you're trying to track or take away from some other office? It, was, it makes sense to me. And and the thing, you know, I know, I, I, I know that everyone hates it when some old grandpa starts whining about how much better it was yesterday, but I'm going to, I'm going to do it right now. Um, when I got out of school, um, a dentist, you know, they owned the land and building and the practice and they would sell the practice. And let's just say they sold it for a dollar and it was for a seven uh, year term, a 10% interest rate. They would carry the paper. Now, I, that was much better than going through some third party bank who doesn't know anybody because back then they were actually worried who he was going to give his patience to. It wasn't the dollar amount of the sell. It was like, is this going to be a good guy? He's not going to over-treat. He's going to warranty his work. Is he going to be, is he going to make the community better? Not some stranger that I'm just going to take the money and run. But when the dentist sold the practice for a dollar, the 10% interest rate for seven years made him another dollar. So now instead of selling it for one, now he has that $1 again. That's like a a down payment. Uh, uh, And then he's got that dollar spread out over seven years again. And then at the end of seven years in real estate, the only variable in real estate really is uh, can you uh, um, sell it? And um, here's a person who's practiced here seven years. Everybody knows the practice and all that kind of stuff. So then he wants to buy the land and building, but he doesn't have much room to negotiate. I mean, hell, he's got all of his equipment there. So then he sells it for the final third. So Doc got $3 over seven years instead of selling a dollar and run. But better yet, since you sell the invisible, I mean, if I go to a Circle K and say I want a Diet Coke or a Dr. Pepper, I know the difference between Diet Coke and Dr. Pepper. Uh, one of them's not a real doctor. And, uh, and but um, in dentistry, we're selling invisible. When I look at Rick and you say, hey, Howie, you, you got four cavities. I mean, what am I going to do? do you know, I mean, I, I have to believe you and trust you or not. And the number one thing that is, is correlated with uh, trust is employee turnover. And we see this repeatedly. I'm out here in Arizona, ground zero for DSOs. And every dentist I know that I say, well, what is it like practicing across the street from that big DSO? And they said, it's the same thing every day. He said, patients come in and say, every time I go in there, it's a different dentist. Some dentist told me I needed four cavities. When the next time he's not even there. And then the new dentist says, I only have two. And then he did two, then I went back, and now another dentist says I have four more. And, you know, it's just crazy. So by having that seller sell to you, um, the old man, and then he stays on with you a day a week, he transfers that trust. He's still part of the family. You're the new baby in the family. And when you're selling the invisible, trust is everything. Do you agree or disagree? Oh, absolutely. And actually, I did I did a practice like that in in Massachusetts. Um not naming names. He was a very famous sports figure and he wanted to, uh, he want, and I convinced a, a good friend of mine and classmate to, uh, buy his practice and he put it on the market and he wanted this for this. And he looked around and I think he was really interested in making sure his patients were, were comfortable with, uh, the new dentist. And he wasn't satisfied with the people that were looking at the practice. So finally, my friend said, can you come over and talk to him and just, you know, tell him what you do? And so I went in there and I talked to him and I, we reminisced he's about his sport. And I said, look, I said, we'll call my friend Jay. Jay is probably the best person you could want for your practice. You know, he's going to treat your patients for respect. He used to cover for you when you were out of town. And I said, all you have to do now is figure out what the heck the price is and what the terms are and just let it go at that. And he go, and I says, but I tell you, you'd do him a real favor if you'd stick around for six months. He didn't need the money. He had made his money in professional sports, but he stuck around. And after I left, after that, that, that consultation that I had, he goes, I like your friend. I, I trust him. He goes, let's get this done. So sometimes, you know, for the consulting part, it's just a matter of, of being a third party. And that's what I tell people is like, you know, sometimes you just need somebody else to look at. 
one of the things you probably did very early on in your career is you probably visited a lot of offices because you wanted to see what people did. And I call those nuggets. And I did the same thing when I was in the military. For three years, I visited every friend and person that would let me in their office. And I'd sit there and take notes because I knew that every dentist had great ideas. But if you compile all those ideas, you can have a pretty good office going right out of the box. These are issues that have been around forever, but um, they kind of the pandemic's kind of drawn them out. And one is uh, insurance. They um, they didn't cover the PPE fee, and a lot of dentists said, "Damn it, that's the last straw. I'm dropping de- I'm dropping dental insurance." Uh, when you when you hear somebody a dentist say that, um, what runs through your mind? I mean, is that a is it a, a good strategy just to drop all dental insurance? Is it a, a pie in the sky? I mean. Um, a lot of dentists say they don't participate in any PPOs and then they're like, dude, you're a Delta provider. And they don't even know that's a, I mean, when I got out of school, I set my fees to Delta and they paid a hundred percent of clean exams, x-rays, 80% of root canals, fillings and half on crown and bridge. Now they send me the fee and I was charged. I was sending them the fee for a crown of a thousand in 1987. And now they're telling me they'll agree to 650. So the number one overhead in dentistry today didn't even exist when I got out of school. When I got out of school, labor was the number one overhead. Now it's 42% coast to coast adjusted production from your fee to the uh, PPO fee. Then there's labor 25%. But what, what would you say to a kid if he says, I- I'm in Miami and I'm just going to drop insurance? Would you say go for it? That's a great strategy. Or would you say you're out of your mind? Or what, well, I'd, well, say, I'd, say, I'd say you're going to need to do some demographic research before you do that. Because to tell you the truth, what you just described is the way I per, I practiced the last, uh, let's see, from uh, 1990, 1989 to 2008, I did not practice, I uh, did not accept insurance assignment. So when I sold my practice, I had $200 of accounts receivable. Do you think that you can reproduce that everywhere in this country? Absolutely not. And I would never cookie cut that kind of program that I did for myself to anybody. However, I like your, I like your Delta story because I get this all the time. I ask people, I says, do you participate in any PPOs? And then they say, oh, absolutely not. And I go, you take Delta? And they say, well, yeah. And I said, well, you do know that Delta is a PPO, right? I, I just want to let you know that. So not picking on Delta, it's interesting how a dentist approaches things. The insurance part, it's really difficult to understand. All I know is is that if you merge and acquire practices, you can become less insurance dependent simply by economics. You may, you know, if you're if you have an ample amount of patient and your and your patient flow is good, you may be able to transition to a program like that. But to just plop down in any demographic area, would you do that in would you do that in Peoria, Illinois? With, uh, you know, uh, John Deere being the only insurance provider? I don't think so. You know, you'd have to really watch out before you do that. So it takes some, you know, it takes some analyzing. There's a way to do that. But uh, what what income did you say you would need for be insurance independent? What kind of income? Or household income or? No, Merges Act, you know, if you did a merger, you might be totally independent from insurance. If you had enough patients coming in from that merger and you say, you know, we're not going to do this anymore. This is the way it's doing it, especially if you acquired a practice that wasn't dealing with insurance. So you could say, OK, from now on, we won't do that. But that's a tough road to hold. And if we did that, I would not be, you know, I, I'm doing a disservice to your to your audience by thinking this is really easy to do. It takes a lot of research and takes a lot of internal, when we switched to not taking insurance assignment, it took a lot of staff meetings to get the wording right for our patients. And you have to be able to file those insurances immediately, which shouldn't be a problem these days. You should file those, those things should be filed electronically so they get reimbursed immediately. The one thing I did find out, Howard, and I think you'll you'll laugh at this is, used to take me six weeks to get a check from insurance companies. When I became free of that, how come they used to get the check to my patient in three weeks? That's kind of interesting. 
And that's a classic example of a, of a tactic that it, your local state dental society is arguing with your representatives. And, um, you know, um, that, that's a classic example where uh, Delta uh, abuses dentists by if you're not uh, in network, they'll send the check to your patient and the patient routinely will cash that and spend it. I mean, the first time I that happened to me, the very first time, I still remember her name. I won't say her last name on the deal, but her first name is Sandy, and I'll never forget her. And she and, and she was so insane that she says, well, you know, I was really broken. I really need the money, and you're so sweet, Howard. I knew you'd understand. I thought, oh, my God. Now I can, what am I supposed to say? No, no I'm actually a real asshole, and I, I want you to get back. Um, I want to, uh, I can't believe we've gone over an hour, but I, I want to switch to a, a totally different subject. Um, when, when you, you know, I've been on Dental Town at least four hours a day every day from 1999, seven days a week till yesterday. And if I had to sum up what stresses out my homies, it's, it's people. It's either their patients or their staff. I mean, they just don't do good with people. They're they're introverts. They they grew up in a library. Um, they just um, it's just not that they're, they're they're safe spot. And you were a, a Air Force United States Air Force Commander, nine twenty Aeromedical Staging Squadron, of a two hundred and forty member highly deployed squadron assigned to six continents and four areas of responsibility. Um, what did you learn? managing 240 people in the United States Air Force that my homies could um, learn and take away to managing their five-person team? Okay, so it's a big stretch from going from a dental office to a medical commander, but it, in a way, it's the same way. I can tell you one thing right now. What I would tell your homies is it's not the dental, it's the mental. So instead of spending $300 on the 14th course on composite bonding in the first 10 years of your career, start taking things a little bit off the wall, like right brain, uh, right brain thinking, uh, positive reinforcement, uh, that kind of, and you're gonna get that. Some of it is coming into dental continuing ed, but a lot of times state boards don't let you have credit for it. And I tell your homies, the heck with it. Take it for your personal, you know, benefit. Go out and get a course, you know, uh, go out and get a, any type of course that a lot of other businesses, you know, call up, the, call up the local McDonald's franchise, talk to the manager and says, when you need motivational or, or, or staff handling, uh, you know, business courses, where do you go? You know, uh, Disney has, uh, Disney down the street here, we have a, a timeshare situation with Disney. The, Disney in Orlando runs a program where they show you how to do, how they do the Disney way. The Ritz Carlton does the same thing. They have programs. And that type of customer service experience is what you really need to get across. But managing people, whether you're managing a, a military squadron, and everybody says, well, it's really easy to manage a military squadron. You're the colonel. And they just say, yes, sir. Well, guess what? It doesn't work that way. Do you ever try to manage 10 physicians, all of them highly trained trauma docs or 30 nurses? You know, I got to tell you something. The best thing I ever did my first week in uh, being a military commander was watching the physicians and the nurses go at it. And I, the first thing that came in my mind is, wow, dentists think they have it bad with dental hygienists. You got to see those two groups go at it. It, it is amazing just to sit back. It's worth the price of admission. One, one other thing on the um, um, the staff problem is uh, not only does it stress them out, they 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 the, the easy when they ask for a dollar raise, um, it, it's just easier to give it to them than think about it. And a lot of these guys go to sell their office, and they've been giving their staff a dollar raise every time the Earth goes around the sun. And they, they want, they, you know, they, they're right. They don't want staff turnover. They want to build long-term relationships. That's all true. But their, pay, their staff labor just keeps drifting up higher and higher and higher. And the DSOs all decided they're going to start doing de novos because when you, they buy your dental office with 30% labor and they got to get it down to 25, it's not going to make anyone happy. They, they, you know. So do you, what do you see 
staff labor do, do you see that as a problem in general or what what are your what are your thoughts on staff labor because when you go get a job at McDonald's I mean just good old McDonald's I mean um McDonald's is um you know I uh, I grew up with my dad and uh cutting um, uh, Sonic Drive-in and my gosh uh, McDonald's a lot of people don't realize the the uh um accounting but my gosh uh, McDonald's um, estimates the average total startup investment ranges from a million to $2 million with franchises netting an estimated annual profit of roughly $150,000. Now, a lot of dentists, uh, they say, God, I mean, if you bought an office for seven fifty dollars to a million, I mean, it's going to be a million or under. A McDonald's is a million to $2 million, And then if you own a McDonald's, you're going to net one fifty. I mean, my gosh, I mean, dentistry is so much better than a McDonald's. But when I go get a job at McDonald's, you know, their uh, net sales, um, say, here's the estimated breakdown, net sales, 2700000 food costs 800000 pay per 100000 so gross profit, a million seven, crew payroll, 540000 or half million, manager payroll, 100000 payroll taxes, 54. But the bottom line is when you go get a job at a crew, they say, hey, Howie, you're, uh, you're going to cook french fries and we're going to start you at a uh, minimum wage, say it's 15 bucks. And the highest range a french fry maker could make is 17. So the range is 15 to 17. So when you get to 17, don't ever be coming back here asking me for a raise because, dude, you're a dental assistant. The maximum we pay dental assistants is $20 an hour. The maximum we pay hygienists is $40 an hour. So if you're a dental assistant and want to make $150,000, you need to start thinking about going to dental school or hygiene school or being an office manager or something else. But satisfaction equals perception minus expectations. And HR, you, your HR design is that it's based on a astrology that every time the earth goes around the sun and passes uranus you give them another dollar and then it drifts up to 30 from 25 to 30 percent and then five percent of your office that would have been profit dollars from having capital employed in a dental office is is not to be seen so i mean hr starts with having a formal conversation and they they just don't do it i mean they don't have uh, job descriptions they don't set payroll ranges how do you how do you how do you get a dentist who, again, wants to sit in a library and read about gravity and the speed of light? Um, he doesn't want to sit there, and he, he perceives that, I don't want to have a battle with my hygienist about not giving her a dollar. I'd rather just quit. How, how, how do you change your mindset? So I started working with uh, HR people. I'm glad you mentioned that. Because I think you have to outsource HR now, for, for especially small practices. And the way you would do it is you would either do it through a consultant like myself, or you, you would actually hire somebody that would do that kind of work for you. And one of the things that we did early on, even when I was in Maine, is, you know, with the retirement plan, it's so easy now. First of all, they have safe harbor 401ks where, the, you know, you put a, automatically you put an amount for the, for the employee. And then you got to start thinking. you got to start thinking in a different manner. You got to get get away from that dollar per hour mindset that you just spoke about. And you got to get into the nitty gritties of, well, what do you do? Well, I provide health insurance. Well, how much does that cost? This is how much it is per hour. This is what it costs me to give you this as a benefit. And then you're going to say, like the thing I used to do, I never did my initial interviews. And one of the last things I said before we hired somebody is, I just looked at the my potential employee and said, Look, you can go everywhere in town and get more per hour, but I guarantee you that not everybody is going to get give you a 401k, health insurance, and other benefits, including a health savings account. And I said, and if you do, then grab that job. And if they can, if they can still pay you more than, than I'm paying you, have at it. But that's one of the things you have to do today is you have to look at the whole picture. And so while you're helping them with their retirement plans, you're helping yourself. And now it's so easy with 401ks now, there's a new law basically where they have to opt out. So you immediately put them on that. But more importantly, you have to show them how much that how much they get. One of the things I used to get in the military at the end of the year was this W-2 that had all my benefits on. It showed the social security breakdown. It showed the match. It showed me the, the value of a health benefit. It showed me the value of everything that the Air Force provided for me. 
And yeah, I knew darn well that I wasn't making as much as that guy in, in private practice in Chandler. But I also knew that I didn't have to pay the what what that dentist was making for health insurance either. So you have to get smart about stuff like that. And these are the types of things that young dentists really need to latch on early on in their practice life. And once you start latching on like that, it gets easier and easier as you get to be our age. Well, luckily, we're both not nearly as old as Caesar Sabatez. I mean, my gosh, we're just young spring chickens compared to that guy. But hey, his name is Richard Hewitt. Uh, his web, his consulting website is militarydentist.com. His email is Dr. Hewitt, H-U-O-T, at militarydentist.com. I mean, come on, guys. Uh, works faster, better, easier, cheaper, smaller. Rick, thank you so much for coming on the show. I know uh, you did that as a favor uh, to me. Uh, and um, thank you so much for coming on the show. And uh, good luck trying to help these dentists all navigate through the pandemic. Um, it's been a pleasure being with you this whole time. And hopefully I'll see you in January in Scottsdale. I'm looking forward to it. Oh, my gosh. Let's do it. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you. You're great.